Lesson 9. Lesson 9, we're going to continue on looking at sentence parts. But what I want to do first at the beginning of this lesson is to take up the diagramming of those five sentences that I assigned from Lesson 8. Remember, we're looking at the basic sentence parts, your subject, your verb, your complements. And when you diagram those words on the baseline, those words will make sense together. So let's take a look at sentence number three. We have the Macedonians became the first European Christians. So let's take a look at diagramming this. You've already done your subjects, your verbs. You've already labeled the uh, complements. So it's just a matter of putting it on the picture, on the diagram. We have Macedonians. And the action or the linking is became. And the complement that finishes that is Christians. We're looking for the noun that follows it. And those three words make sense together. Macedonians became Christians. Now, let's do the divisions. Vertical line all the way through, separating the subject and the verb. Became is a linking verb. Christians, Macedonians, those are nouns. It's identifying Macedonians. Therefore, we have a predicate nominative. And the line is a slanted line, stopping at the baseline. Now, the rest of the words in the sentence are modifiers. <clears throat> we have the Macedonians. We have the first European. Christians has three adjectives. Remember I stated earlier that when the first word is being diagrammed, you always capitalize that first word of the sentence. The is the first word, therefore it requires a capital. And then we have the Christians and first Christians and European. And that's how you diagram sentence number three. All right, let's go on to sentence number five. Sentence number five is a question. So to help you diagram it, you've already got your verb and your subject. You can make it into a statement. You could say, you have ever seen the tulip fields of Holland in the spring? It sounds a little odd because it's supposed to be a question, but it might help you when you're diagramming it. So let's do the baseline. The subject is you. Notice you is not capitalized because it's not the first word in the sentence. Now we have have seen as our verb phrase. Have is capitalized. All right, have seen whom or what? Fields. You have to be careful. We think of tulips as a noun, but in this sentence it's being used as an adjective. The noun, the complement, is fields. All right, let's divide it. Subject verb. Complement. This is an action verb. The main verb is an action verb. Therefore, we have a direct object because the fields answers what after seeing. Therefore, we have a vertical line that stops at the baseline. And now we have modifiers. <clears throat> we have the, whoops, wrong color. Tulips, or just tulip. 
Mm -hmm. Now, the other words of Holland in the spring are prepositional phrases. Um, I'll show you how they're diagram. We haven't talked about this, but I'll show you how they fit on the diagram as modifiers. We are going to be taking a look at prepositional phrases. We looked at them when we talked about the preposition. So we're going to continue on, but I'll just show you on this diagram, even though you didn't have to diagram it, you were just diagramming the basic sentence parts and their adjectives and adverbs. But we do have ever as well. And I think that is it, other than the prepositional phrase. So we have ever, and we have tulip. Now, for the prepositional phrases, of Holland is a prepositional phrase, and it acts as an adjective, it's modifying fields. And then you have the prepositional phrase, in the spring. In the spring, is another prepositional phrase, and it's also a modifier. And if you were diagramming those, you would diagram them under field. And then in the spring um, is an adverb answering the question when, and you would diagram it underneath uh, the verb. So we're just going to leave prepositional phrases, and we'll be looking at those a little later on. Now, let's go on to our next sentence. Great ridges and trenches on the ocean floor form vast ranges of hidden mountain ranges. Let's just erase what we have to give us some room. Whenever you diagram, you always want to give yourself plenty of room to diagram so that you can draw your horizontal and vertical lines without having them run together and crowd the others. In sentence number six, you have a compound subject. And remember we had that double construction for compound subjects? That looks something like this, and this. Our compound subject, bridges, trenches. Diagram them in the order that they appear. Ridges, trenches. All right, and the verb is form. Make sure you leave a, a space between the point and the verb. And form what? ranges. So, ridges, trenches, form ranges. Those words all make sense together. All right, let's divide the verb. Again, you want to leave a space between the point and the verb. This is an action verb, therefore we have a direct object. We have a vertical line that stops right at the baseline. Now, we have an adjective for great. Great is modifying ridges. Hmm. I believe in this sentence, great is modifying both nouns, ridges and trenches. When that happens, let me move my lines over. I just realized that. It's not just great ridges, but it's also great ridges and great trenches. I'm going to move this one over, and I'll show you how to diagram an adjective when it's modifying both nouns. So we'll move this over a little bit. Since this is a compound part, we can draw a slanted line on the subject side. This is the subject side of our baseline. And since great is modifying both nouns, we diagram it there, showing that it's describing both. 
And it also begins with a capital letter. It's the first word of the sentence. Ranges. We have vast ranges. So, great ridges, trenches form ranges that are vast. All right, now we need to place our conjunction and. And it sits on the broken line. As I said before, we have on the ocean floor, and again, that is a prepositional phrase. It's acting as an adjective of hidden mountains. That's an adjective phrase as well, prepositional phrase, and it's modifying ranges. All right, let's go on to number seven. Historians consider Hippocrates the father of modern medicine. Give yourself lots of room for your baseline. Historians is the first word. It is the subject. It will be capitalized. Verb, consider. Consider whom or what? Hippocrates. We have the verb consider. We have an objective complement, another complement that's complementing Hippocrates. And it's explaining or renaming, and that word is father. All right, historians consider Hippocrates father. Again, all the words make sense. It doesn't sound odd. It might sound not very descriptive because we're missing the adjectives, but it does make sense. Separate the subject and the verb. Separate the direct object and the action verb. And then if you remember, for the objective complement, since father is identifying Hippocrates, it has a slanted line slanting towards the objective complement, or the direct object. For the adjectives, we have the father, And then we have a prepositional phrase, of modern medicine. And that would be an adjective prepositional phrase describing father. Which father of modern medicine? And now we just have one more to do. And that would be number eight. The colors of the painting were unusually somber. Make some room. And the subject of the verb is colors. The verb is were. We have a linking verb, colors, were. Now, what is the complement that is either describing or identifying colors? And it's somber. Somber is an adjective, and it's modifying colors. It's describing it. And our division, subject verb. Complement, predicate, adjective, leans back towards the subject because that's what it's describing. Now, we also have the adjectives the. And also we have a prepositional phrase of the painting, which would be modifying colors. And unusually, unusually is describing somber. 
and usually is an adverb and is adding emphasis to the adjective somber. Remember when we defined what an adverb was? An adverb is a modifier, and when it modifies an adjective or another adverb, it's adding emphasis. In that sentence, we could leave it out. The colors of the painting were somber. But the word unusually just makes it more definite and gives it a little bit of extra. So they are underneath the words they modify. The and unusually. Unusually. Now, colors of the painting, as I said before, of the painting is a prepositional phrase. Let me just show you on this diagram, since it's our last one, how you would diagram that prepositional phrase. Since it's modifying colors, it'll go under colors. We use a slanted line, and then from that slanted line, we draw a horizontal line, and we leave an extension. All right, we don't cut it off and do it that way. There is another sentence part that is diagrammed that way. But for prepositional phrases, we use the slanted line, leave the extension, and then also use a horizontal line. The preposition sits on the slanted line. And remember, a prepositional phrase has a noun that follows it, and painting, is the noun. And then the is also an adjective modifying painting, and it would go there. And that's how you would diagram a prepositional phrase on that type of structure. All right. That finishes our diagramming lessons. Remember, when you do diagram your baseline, all those words will make sense together. Continuing on with Lesson 9, I said earlier that we're going to take a look at phrases. Phrases is another sentence part, where we take a look at parts of speech. We see that they can be used to form sentence parts. We have subjects that can be nouns and pronouns. We have our verbs. We have our complements. And we learned that our complements can be nouns, they can be pronouns, and they can be also adjectives. It depends upon the kind of complement. So we're going to take a look at another sentence part called phrases. Now in lesson eight, we looked at verbals. Verbals, if you remember, are a verb form, but they're also used as another part of speech. Verbals can be used as nouns, they can be used as adjectives, and they can be used as adverbs. Now we're going to take a look at phrases, and that's another sentence part. And there are several types of phrases that we're going to take a look at in this lesson. But I want you to keep in mind the basic definition, and you'll see that in your notes. Follow along. A phrase is a group of related words that does not contain a subject and its verb. You remember I made reference to that often when we were looking for subjects and verbs in your assignments and when we did them on the board, that a subject of the sentence is never found in a phrase. And the verb of the sentence is never found in a phrase. So a phrase is a group of related words that does not contain a subject and its verb. A phrase is used as a single part of speech. So it's a group of related words, and they're used as a single part of speech. Now, a phrase may function as a noun, an adjective, or an adverb. And you'll see that in your notes. Phrases can be classified according to their structure and their purpose in the sentence. Just like when we we're analyzing the sentences, we can analyze the sentence by its part of speech, and we can also do a picture analyzation by diagramming it to show the relationship of the words. So phrases can be classified into groups according to their structure and what makes them up, what they contain. Now, the main types of phrases that we're going to take a look at are your prepositional phrases. 
we're going to take a look at verbal phrases, a participial phrase, which contains a participle, a gerund phrase, which contains a gerund, and an infinitive phrase, which contains an infinitive. We're also going to take a look at the appositive phrase, and the appositive phrase I have mentioned before is just a noun and its modifiers, and it identifies another noun. But the first phrase that we're going to take a look at is the prepositional phrase. Now, to help us refresh our memory, we're going to go back to your lesson three. So if you could turn back to lesson three, that's where we covered prepositions. And I want to go over the list of prepositions so that when we take a look at prepositional phrases, you'll have your list there before you and you'll be able to refer to it. So as I have said before, a prepositional phrase acts as a modifier. You remember I mentioned that when we took up our sentences for the diagramming. And a prepositional phrase consists of a preposition and its noun or pronoun. Now, that noun or pronoun has a name. We call it the object of the preposition. Now within that prepositional phrase, it can have its own modifiers. It can have its own adjectives. So a prepositional phrase, if you look at your definition there in your note, a prepositional phrase consists of, prepos of a preposition, its noun or pronoun, the, the object of the preposition, and any modifiers of that object. Now, let's just review your list of commonly used prepositions. I'm just going to read through them and say them with me uh, or follow along. I find it's helpful if you can talk out loud and say them along with me. Aboard, about, above, across, after, against, along, amid, among, around, at, before, behind, below, beneath, beside, between, beyond, but when it means except by, down, during, except, for, from, in, into, like, near, of, off, on, over, past, since, through, throughout, to, toward, under, underneath, until, unto, up, upon, with, within, without. And if you continue on with your note, you'll also remember that groups of prepositions can work together as one. And let's take a look at the compound prepositions that work together as one. According to, as for, as well as, because of, by way of, except for, in front of, in addition to, in spite of, instead of, on account of, out of, regardless of, with regard to, and together with. So we're going to put some sentences on the top on the whiteboard and we'll take a look and find prepositional phrases. Looking at the sentences on the whiteboard, let's find prepositional phrases. You have your preposition lists before you there from lesson three. To start with, I always like to start with the verb and the subject. Start with the action, the linking verb, ask yourself who or what before the verb and find the subject. And then from there, let's look for prepositional phrases. Remember, subjects and verbs are never found in prepositional phrases, so therefore it's good to find them first. We gave them a basket of fresh fruit. What's the action? What's the heart of the sentence? Gave. Gave is the verb. Who or what gave? We. We gave what? Basket. It's a direct object. Gave to whom, for whom, them. Your indirect object. Remember the indirect object is always sandwiched between your verb and your direct object. Now, let's find the prepositional phrase. We have a preposition of, the object of the preposition, the noun, Fruit. The phrase of fresh fruit. I'm going to put parentheses around it because it's a unit and it works together as one. We have our preposition. We have our noun, which is the object of the preposition. 
Now, let's take a look at it. Fresh is an adjective modifying fruit. So within that unit, the object of the preposition can have its own modifier. We have an adjective modifying fruit. All right, let's go on to number two. Let's find the prepositional phrase. But first, let's do our basic sentence parts. What is the verb, whether it's action or linking, is? Who or what is? Well, be careful. We have an apostrophe S. Cindy's is possessive. It's acting as an adjective. But the subject is house. We have a linking verb, therefore we have either a predicate adjective or a predicate nominative following the linking verb. And that would be the word one. And one is a predicate nominative. If you remember, one is a pronoun. And it's from our list of indefinite pronouns that we looked at. Let's find the prepositional phrase. Preposition with, what is the noun that's working with the preposition? Shutters, we have a unit with green shutters. A prepositional phrase beginning with the preposition with and ending with shutters, the noun which is the object of the preposition. And green is describing what kind of shutters. So again, we have an adjective within the prepositional phrase, but as a unit, it works together as one. It's a sentence part. Number three, the students in my science class are taking a field trip. What is the verb? And always be mindful in case it's a verb phrase. The main verb is taking. The helping verb is are, so we have a verb phrase, are taking. Who or what are taking? Now, be careful. Students is the subject. Taking a look at in my science class. Remember I said subjects are never found in a prepositional phrase? We have to go all the way back and find the noun that's not in the phrase. Are taking whom or what? Taking is an action verb, so we have a direct object, trip. What kind of trip? Field trip. Field is modifying trip. Now let's go back and look at the prepositional phrase. We have the preposition in, and class is the object of the preposition. It's the noun in the prepositional phrase. And number four. Number four, the book of poems and short stories was exceptional. What is the verb? The verb is was. Exceptional is not a verb. It's description. You can't exceptional. All right? So be careful with that. All right? We have was as a linking verb. Now, let's go back and find the subject, who or what was. And be careful. We have to go all the way back to book. Because here, separating the subject and the verb, we have another prepositional phrase. Subjects are never found in a prepositional phrase. Let's take a look at exceptional. Since it's following a linking verb, exceptional is description, and what part of speech describes after a linking verb? The adjective. So we have a P made, a predicate adjective, describing a book. In sentence number four, I wanted to illustrate that in a prepositional phrase, you can have a compound noun, a compound object of the preposition. Poems, stories, objects of the preposition of. So you could have compound parts even in prepositional phrases. So I wanted to do that sentence just to show that. Now, we found prepositional phrases, and I have said earlier that prepositional phrases describe, and they modify. So we're going to continue on. What two parts of speech modify? There are only two parts of speech that describe and modify, and they are your adjectives and your adverbs.
Adjectives and adverbs are the two parts of speech that modify. Therefore, if prepositional phrase is modified, then we have adjective prepositional phrases and we have adverb prepositional phrases. And the first thing I want to take a look at is your adjective prepositional phrase. And we're going to take a look at the sentences that are on the whiteboard because they illustrate the adjective and being a modifier of a noun or a pronoun. Number one, we gave them a basket of fresh fruit. Well, we know the prepositional phrases of fresh fruit. Um, it answers the question, what kind of basket of fresh fruit? So we have an adjective prepositional phrase following the noun it describes. And as a whole unit, the whole unit is describing basket. Number two, Cindy's house is the one with green shutters. With green shutters is describing the word that comes before it, the predicate nominative, one. So as a whole unit, the adjective prepositional phrase is modifying one. And in turn, one is identifying house. Notice the position of the adjective prepositional phrase when it modifies a noun. Most often, it will follow immediately after the noun that it's describing. Number three also illustrates that. We have the prepositional phrase in my science class. All right, which students? When you think of the questions that adjectives answer about the words they describe, what kind, which one, whose, how many, or how much, prepositional adjective phrases will do the same. So, which students, or which ones, in my science class? In my science class is a prepositional phrase acting as an adjective and is describing students. Number four, the book of poems and short stories was exceptional. Well, we know of poems and short stories is a prepositional phrase. Take a look at, it's following the noun, the subject book, and it's describing book. What kind of book or which one? So, prepositional phrases can be adjectives. They can modify nouns or pronouns. When an adjective phrase follows a noun immediately, then usually it's an adjective phrase to help you identify it. If it's a phrase that follows a noun, then usually it's your adjective phrases. And just like the regular adjective, it can answer the questions, uh, which one, what kind of, how many, how much, and whose. So that's the first one, the prepositional phrase, that's an adjective. Now, when we talk about an adjective phrase, we don't necessarily have to repeat the word prepositional all the time. When I make reference to an adjective phrase, it will always be prepositional. So I'll talk about adjective phrases, then you know it's a prepositional phrase. Now we're going to continue on and take a look at the adverb phrase. And we'll put some sentences on the whiteboard so that we can look at the adverb prepositional phrase. Let's continue on with the adverb prepositional phrase. I have some sentences on the board. Prepositions are in front of you from your lesson three. Again, in the sentences, let's find the subjects, the verbs, and the complements, and that'll help eliminate in helping us to find the prepositional phrases. Number one, during World War II, Hitler had millions of people killed. Now, this is a little bit unusual, but let's find the verb. The verb is had. Who or what had? Hitler. Hitler is the subject. Had who or what? Millions. Direct object. Now you might think, well, the word killed is there. Well, you need to be careful. Take a look at killed and what it contains. We are in a prepositional phrase, all right? Uh, 
All right. Now, we have another prepositional phrase. Sometimes um, it can be confusing because it ends in ing, but during is a preposition. During World War II. The object of the preposition is World War II. During is the preposition. And in this one, of is the preposition. And people is the object of the preposition. And you might think, well, what about killed? Remember in our previous lesson when we looked at verbals and how the participle can um, be used as another part of speech? And that's what that phrase is about. All right, but this phrase begins with of. Notice it follows millions. That phrase is an adjective phrase. But we've looked at adjective phrases, so I want to take a look at the first prepositional phrase, during World War II. During World War II answers the question, when? And remember, adverbs can answer the question, when? Remember, there are other questions, how, when, where, to what extent? All right, so those are the other questions that adverbs can answer. And in this sentence, during World War II answers the question, when? Had, when. During World War II is an adverb phrase. Modifying the verb, had. Notice this position. We've spoken about this before. To add variety to your sentences, to make your writing interesting, it's good if you can begin a sentence with a prepositional phrase. During World War II can be moved. It doesn't have to begin the sentence. We can move it. Hitler had millions of people killed during World War II. We can even put it at the end. But to add sentence variety and for interest, it's placed at the beginning. Notice what it is at the beginning. Not all adverb phrases are separated by a comma, but some are. And when we get into punctuation and the proper use of a comma, we'll be touching on that. All right, number two. After the game, the teams stopped for a burger. Let's find the action. Let's find the verb, whether it's linking or action. Stopped. Who or what stopped? Teams. Stopped, whom or what? Well, there is no complement. All right? But we do have prepositional phrases. For a burger. For is a preposition. Burger is the object of the preposition. It's the noun. For a burger. We have another prepositional phrase. After the game. After the game, the team stopped for a burger. After the game, the preposition is after. The noun, the object of the preposition is game. As a unit, it's a modifier, and it's modifying stopped. It answers, well, what question? When? When stopped? After the game. And this one answers when. And this one also answers when as well. Now, stopped for a burger. That answers the question why. Why is another uh, question that adverb phrases can answer. So, modifying stopped why for a burger. Number three, my father jogs early in the morning. All right, what's the verb, whether it's action or linking? Jobs. Who or what jobs? Father. Subject. All right, jobs when? Early. We have an adverb. And it's modifying jobs. Remember, many adverbs end in ly. Now, we have a prepositional phrase, in the morning. Notice what in the morning is following. It's following an adverb. And if you remember when we talked about the adverb, the adverb can modify a verb 
an adjective, or another adverb. All right, so those are the three things an adverb can modify. An adverb can modify a verb, and those adverb phrases do. And also an adverb can modify an adjective or an adverb. In sentence number three, it is following the adverb. And it's modifying the word early, the adverb early. Number four, eating too many sweets is not good for one's health. Well, what's the verb, whether it's action or linking? We have is. All right. Who or what is? Well, we have, if you remember when we did verbals, we have the gerund that ends in ing and the gerund can act as a noun. We have eating. But we also have a whole phrase of words working with eating. And we're going to look at this today as we look at phrases. This is what we call a gerund phrase. And as a unit, it's acting as a subject. But the main subject is eating. Eating is, we have a linking verb. So that means it's followed either by a predicate adjective or a predicate nominative. And this one is good. We have a predicate adjective. Not is always an adverb, always an adverb. And then our preposition of phrase is for one's health. Now, notice it's following the predicate adjective, following the adjective. Notice in here, the adverb phrase was following the adverb, adding emphasis to it, or explaining it even further, not just early, but early in the morning. Not just um, good for one's health. So we have an adverb phrase modifying the adjective, good. When an adverb modifies a verb, and you'll notice this in the sentence, it can be anywhere in the sentence because we can rearrange the sentence and put it at the beginning. However, when an adverb phrase is modifying an adjective or another adverb, it usually follows it. For one's health is following good when it's modifying the adjective. In the morning, it's following the adverb early when it's modifying it. So when the adverb phrase is modifying an adjective or an adverb, it will come before it, or come after it, I'm sorry. When it's modifying a verb, it can come anywhere, whether it's before it, at the end of the sentence, in the middle of the sentence, it can be anywhere in the sentence. So adverb phrases, like the adverb, modifies a verb, an adjective, or an adverb. Like the adverb, an adverb phrase answers the question how, when, where, to what extent, as well as the word why. So prepositional phrases, they are something that can add interest to your sentence, especially at the beginning. Let's go back and take a look at the sentences. For some of these, we can leave out the adverb phrase and still have a complete thought. So it is a sentence part that adds to the sentence to make it interesting. And number one, Hitler had millions of people killed. We can leave out during World War II and it still makes sense. But during World War II just makes it that more definite. Number three, after the game, the team stopped. All right. The team stopped for a burger. All right, we can leave out adverb phrases, but they make the sentence more meaningful. Number three, my father jogs early. All right, early in the morning, it just adds to the sentence. Number four, eating too many sweets is not good. All right, we can leave out the adverb phrase and still have a complete thought. So adverb phrases help make our writing interesting. Adverb phrases and adjective phrases begin with a preposition and end with a noun or a pronoun, which is called the object of the preposition. Adjective phrases describe nouns or pronouns and usually immediately follow that noun or pronoun. The adverb phrase modifies a verb, 
an adjective or an adverb. When it modifies the verb, it can be anywhere in the sentence. When it modifies the adverb or the adjective, then usually that adverb phrase immediately follows it in the sentence. So prepositional phrases are a sentence part. And prepositional phrases are adverb phrases and adjective phrases. Now we're going to continue on taking a look at the other kind of phrase, and that is what we call the verbal phrase. And that's this one, just like in number four. If you remember from our previous lesson, we talked about participles, gerunds, and infinitives. They can be nouns, adjectives, or adverbs. It all depends on how they're functioning in the sentence. You remember the gerund? Ends in ing, and it's a verb form. All right, eating is a verb form. It's ending in ing. Notice the position in the sentence. This one's acting as the subject. You'll also notice that there are other words working with eating. Because it's a verb form, it can have its own modifiers, and it can have its own complements. You might think, all right. But remember, it's all working together as one. This is a unit working together, and it's the subject of the sentence. But it can have its own modifiers, and it can have its own complements. So that's just one example. But we're going to go back and take a look at each one of the verbals. We're going to take a look first at the participle. And when the participle has its own modifiers, and its own complements, we call it a participial phrase. Do you remember the participle acts as an adjective? It's a verbal adjective. So we're going to take a look at some sentence examples where we're going to see the participle and look at the words that are working with it as a unit. Remember the definition of a phrase? It's a group of related words that work together as a sentence part. So let's begin by taking a look at some sentences with the verbal content. Take a look at your notes there about verbal phrases, and let's take a look at some characteristics. It says a verbal phrase contains a verbal and other related words to form a phrase. There are three types of verbal phrases. We've got the participial, the gerund, and the infinitive. Let's take a look first at the participial phrase. And let's take a look at its characteristics. The first characteristic, a participial phrase functions as an adjective. So think of the questions, adjectives answer. Which one, what kind, how many, how much, um, which one? Number three, or the second characteristic. Since it is a verb form, it can have its own complement because it is a verb. It can be followed by an object because it is a verb, a verb form. Another characteristic, the participle can be modified by single adverbs or prepositional phrases. So your participle can have a complement, it can have a single word modifier, an adverb, or it even could have an adverb prepositional phrase. But keep in mind the last characteristic, the entire participle phrase in itself is used as an adjective, even though these other parts are within that participial phrase. And let's take a look at the examples on the board just to illustrate these characteristics of a participial phrase. Number one, gazing at the sunset, we were reminded of the beauty of God's creation. First of all, let's find the main verb, the heart of the sentence and the subject. We're reminded. Who or what were reminded? We. Let's take a look at the verb form. Now remember in participial phrases, the participle can be the present participle, it can end in ing. Or it can be the past participle. It can have a past form, whether it's ed, d, nt, or t. 
Gazing is a present participle. Gazing at the sunset. Notice there's a comma there. This is a whole unit. It is a participial phrase. It begins with the participle, present participle, gazing. But working with it, gazing at the sunset. So as a whole unit, the participial phrase is an adjective. And as a unit, well, who or what is it modifying? Who is it describing? It's describing the subject, we. Now, let's take a look at the participial phrase in itself. Within that unit, it's a verb form, therefore it has a modifier. Within the participial phrase, we have an adverb phrase, at the sunset. So we have another unit within that one, and it's an adverb phrase, modified gazing. So that's a sentence part. As a whole, it's a unit. As a whole, it's modifying we. But within that unit, it has its own adverb prepositional phrase. Now, if you want to take a look at other prepositional phrases, we've got of the beauty and of God's creation. But let's just concentrate on verbals. Number two, the soldier wore a uniform covered with ribbons and metals. All right, let's find the main verb, the heart of the sentence, and the subject. War is your main verb. Who or what war? Soldier. Soldier is who the sentence is about. War, what? Uniform. We have a direct object. Now, take a look at what's following the direct object. Covered with ribbons and medals. Covered with ribbons and medals is a participial phrase. It contains a participle, the past participle covered, and it has its own modifiers with ribbons and medals. So here we have the participial phrase, and it's a participial phrase, and as a unit, it's modifying uniform. What kind of uniform? Covered with ribbons and medals. Notice we have the past participle covered, and then we have a prepositional adverb phrase inside of it. But as a unit, it's acting as an adjective. Number, number three, writing rapidly, Robert completed the report in 10 minutes. Find the main verb, the heart of the sentence. Completed. Who or what completed? What's the subject? Robert. Robert completed who or what? Robert completed report. All right, let's find the verbal phrase. It's a verb form, but it's acting as an adjective. Let's find the participial phrase. Writing rapidly. The participial phrase contains the present participle writing. Writing rapidly. Rapidly is an adverb telling writing how. This participle has an adverb describing it. But as a unit, we want to look at the phrase as a unit. Writing rapidly is the participial phrase. And as a unit, well, who is it describing? Who's writing rapidly? Robert. We have a prepositional phrase in 10 minutes, but that's not a part of the participial. All right, that's an adverb phrase, modifying completed. Number four, the gardener, fearing a frost, covered his plants. What is the main action? Covered. Who or what covered? Gardener. All right, gardener covered what? Plants. Plants is the direct object. 
take a look at what's separating the subject from the main verb. Notice the punctuation. We have a present participial phrase. Fearing is our present participle. Fearing a frost is a whole unit working together. This is a verb form. Fearing what? Frost. Notice within, it has its own direct object. So as we looked at the definition of a participle, it functions as an adjective, but since it's a verb form, it can have its own complements, and it can have its own modifiers. It has an adverb inside the phrase describing it. It has prepositional phrases, an adverb phrase describing it, and an adverb phrase describing it. So it is a unit that acts as an adjective, but within that unit, because it is a verb form, it can have these additional parts. Now, fearing the frost. Well, who's fearing the frost? Gardner. As a unit, it's acting as an adjective, modifying Gardner. Now, I want to point out another characteristic that we haven't looked at, and that's the characteristic of the necessity of a participial phrase. Remember I said earlier that adjectives add interest to your writing. Participial phrases that act as an adjective also add interest. But we can take the participial phrase out of the sentence and we can still have a complete thought. Notice in number one, we were reminded of the beauty of God's creation. We still have a complete thought. But notice the added description and how it makes it more interesting. Gazing at the sunset, beginning the sentence with that adds interest to it. Notice when the participial phrase begins the sentence, it's separated by a comma. Because it's added information and you have a complete thought without it. Number two, the soldier wore a uniform. That's a complete thought. We can leave out the participial phrase and still have a sentence. But notice how the participial phrase adds description and makes it more interesting. The soldier wore a uniform covered with ribbons and medals. It makes a more vivid picture in the reader's mind by adding the extra additional description. Number three, Robert completed the report in 10 minutes. Complete thought. But notice the first part, the participial phrase, writing rapidly, that just adds a little more intensity to it. And again, when it begins the sentence, notice the punctuation. It's separated with a comma. Number four, the gardener covered his plants. Still a complete thought. Fearing a frost is added for description. Notice when the participial phrase follows the noun it describes. It's also separated by commas. That's one thing about the participial phrase. When it's separating in the middle, we use commas. Notice here in number two, no commas are necessary because there is nothing following the participial phrase. So commas aren't necessary there because this participial phrase is modifying at the end of the sentence the direct object. This one begins it, you need a comma. This one begins it, you need a comma. This one follows the noun or pronoun it describes, therefore you need the commas. So participial phrases act as adjectives. Since it's a verb form, it can contain its own modifiers and it can contain its own direct object, all right, its own complements. All right, so that's the participial phrase. I think the participial phrase is one of the easier ones, especially with the commas, to spot in a sentence, especially with the commas. So let's go on and take a look at the gerund. Now the gerund might be a little bit more of a challenge to find because the gerund acts as a noun. And since it acts as a noun and it always ends in ing, it can function as these other sentence parts. Let's take a look at the characteristics of a gerund. A gerund phrase consists of a gerund, and the gerund ends in ing, together with a complement and any modifiers. 
A gerund can be modified by single adverbs or by a prepositional adverb phrase. The entire phrase, with its modifiers and any complements, is used as a noun. All right, now, remember, what are nouns in the sentence? Well, your nouns are subjects, direct objects, uh, predicate nominatives, it can even be um, object of the preposition, and it even can be used as an appositive. So those are all the functions, sentence functions, of the part of speech, noun. And a gerund is, remember the nickname, a verbal noun. We're going to take a look at some sentences to see how gerunds function as a phrase in a sentence.